and welcome everybody to the 15th edition of the Deserve to Win podcast. As always, I'm your host, Eric J. Troutman. And today, of course, I've got my co-host, Pooja. Hi, I'm Queenie. Uh, super excited because on today's show, our special guest, Alex Quilici, the CEO of Umail, the fantastic company behind the Robocall Index. We're going to be talking about so many things, including uh, illegal, maybe legal, <laughs> probably illegal, uh, call labeling, where people are being called scammer, scammers and spammers and marketers, when they're none of those things. Really fascinating to talk to him about that. But before we get there, uh, Queenie, you want to introduce yourself? Or what do you think? Tori, who goes first? Queenie, you're in charge of this show. Sure. Uh, hi, guys. <laughs> Queenie Puja Amin, partner at Trauman Amin LLP. All right. And who are you? I am Tori Gidry. I'm the dame of the TCPA world and Troutman Amin LLP. And one last one. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Brittany Andres, I'm also known as the Baroness of TCPA world and I'm an associate at Troutman Amin LLP. N nothing but pros, I tell you. <laughs> Brilliant pros. Uh, so look, we haven't gotten together in a little while and it just things keep moving so quickly. Lots to cover. This is going to be like a, a bit of, a, of an appellate special because there was a bunch of appellate level TCPA decisions that have come out over the course of the last month. Before we get there though, we have to address two big things. We're not going to dive too deep into this. Um, there's lots of other resources available. We're going to talk about these uh, developments, I think, more in other podcasts. But two things we have to keep in mind. One, update on the FTC and the FCC. All right, the FCC, as you all know, right, ongoing NPRM, that's a notice of proposed rulemaking, to determine whether or not consent can be transferred under the TCPA. Uh, the public knowledge, which is a big uh, special interest group, along with the NCLC, uh, has, has asked the FCC to prevent, to prevent consent from being transferred, meaning that, that all lead generation is dead that, as, as we know it today, that uh, comparison shopping websites can no longer exist, that websites like LendingTree.com can no longer obtain your consent and then sell them to up to five lenders to have the banks compete so that you can win. All of that is at risk right now in front of the FCC. And the uh, 28 attorneys general have come out and said, we agree with that. And 12 Democratic senators have come out and said, we agree with that. And only reach the powerful, responsible enterprises against consumer harassment. The industry's true response, true trade group that's trying to lobby and keep the FCC from doing something crazy. We're the only ones out there with a strong strong reply brief responding to these arguments from a legal perspective, but we still need everybody's help. But really, that is ongoing. That has been ongoing. It's a bit, a bit of a frozen status right now, right? We're getting into the, the fall lobbying season, September, October. We're looking probably for a ruling in November, December. But what really matters right now, what has changed, is the F. TC. That's the sister organization. The FCC, of course, is charged with telecommunications and, and uh, regulating telecommunications in the United States. The FTC is looking at telemarketing, uh, and it's charged with preventing fraud, essentially, in the marketplace. The FTC, which has traditionally really not enforced the telemarketing sales rules, the TSR, very often, against your standard run-of-the-mill telemarketing shop, uh, you know, basically only enforcing it against real fraudsters. That has all changed about uh, three weeks ago. The FTC announced its telemarketing sweep. And as part of that sweep, it's done a few things. It's going after quote unquote consent mills, right? The consent farms, these uh, websites that may or may not be using dark patterns to collect people to get them into the funnel, right? What, you, what, what some might call funnel optimization, the FTC is calling a dark pattern, lying, cheating, tricking, duping consumers to click through a form under false pretenses to give consent, merely to sell that consent. Uh, and the FTC, right, has taken a few positions in these cases that have been now been brought by the DOJ, but most pertinently, most importantly, and most bizarrely, uh, it is using its LinkedIn account, its social media account, to regulate uh, communications in this country and has, uh, through a couple of social media uh, posts that have come out just in the last month, has now taken the position, wait for it everybody, that consent cannot be transferred, period, full stop. You cannot transfer consent if the caller is going to use a pre-recorded call for marketing purposes. That is now definitively been determined, according to a LinkedIn post at least, um, by the FTC to be a violation of the TSR. This is a huge change, just a sea change 
from uh, the FTC's previous position on the matter uh, and an even bigger change from current industry practice, which of course is that they sell these things all the time, and from the current state of case law, which has been uniform that in fact you can transfer consent. So the FTC has now stuck a fork in the ground, a flag in the ground, a fork in the potato, whatever it is, uh, and has said you cannot transfer consent for purposes of the TSR. Will the FCC come along with it? We're going to find out. We're going to find out. We've got a lot more content on this. If you're watching this, you want more information, there's a, a great webinar on our YouTube channel. Check this out. Where the, the, uh, the Duchess and I, along with Isaac over from dnc.com, spend a full hour breaking this down. We don't have more time for it today. Second big development. I told you there was two. Second big development. Numerical, great company, has submitted to the FCC a comment uh, basically saying that call labeling is a massive scam. And you know what? I think they might be right. Now, I don't know this firsthand. I don't have any specific facts that I can point to beyond what's already in the public record and the numerical filing. But I have been suspicious for a long time, given the huge, huge, uh, from my view, uh, percentage of inaccurate labeling that you see out there. This huge, massive um, overstatement that, that calls are, are fraud, calls are scam, calls are spam, calls are marketing when they're not. Right? You see this day in, day out on your own phones. Like I don't have to tell you this. Like, you see it on your own phones. Your own phone calls are being mislabeled. Maybe your number when you call your mom is being mislabeled as scam. Right? We all know that this is happening, but I, and I always suspected it was being done on purpose. And Numerical has come out and basically said, yeah, this is being done on purpose. These analytic engines that the carriers are working with are lying, cheating scumbags. Again, I don't know this. So I'm summarizing what's in the public record. Uh, and they are essentially selling protection money. They are taking your money to make you pay for branded caller ID solutions to prevent you from being labeled by the same company that's offering you a solution. So they've got the power to label you, and then, hey, look, you want to be protected? You want to be safe from my labeling? Well, I guess you got to pay me a little bit. <laughs> it's extortion is what it is. It's extortion. Uh, at least those are the allegations, those are the claims. Do I know that to be true firsthand? I do not. Do I suspect it might be true? Well, based on the over-labeling and the fact that the same companies that are doing the labeling are profiting off of selling the solution to the labeling that they're doing, yeah, that does seem a little suspicious to me. Uh, so I love that Numerical has submitted this. Uh, we're going to talk to Alex Kalishi about this. Uh, and I look forward to having Numerical's counsel and maybe even the divine, shall I say, Rebecca Johnson on the show to talk about this. Uh, fantastic people over there, and I really... I love this. I wish I could spend more time on it, but this is my contribution for the day. <laughs> That's all you guys get from me today. Baroness, what do you got? As far as cases go? No, as far as something else. Yes, as far as cases go. <laughs> okay, so I have a major case, guys, that came down in the 11th Circuit recently, um, and it's called Drazen versus Pinto. It's one of standing. Um, as you folks know, in order to sue, a plaintiff must have Article Three standing under the Constitution. Standing requires that the plaintiff show he or she suffered an injury in fact, that the defendant's causal connection to that injury, and that the injury is redressable by a favorable decision. Um, well, focusing on that first element, the injury in fact component requires that a plaintiff um, show that his or her injury was concrete. Um, now, putting that aside, another major case in the 11th Circuit was Hannah versus Salcedo which essentially held that receipt of a single unwanted text message does not cause concrete harm under the, Constitu uh, under the TCPA. Um, now, coming back to Drazen versus Pinto, the, the 11th Circuit basically turned Salcedo on its head um, and now has held that receipt of a single unwanted text message is sufficient to give rise to Article Three standing um, because these harms are the same kind of harms uh, compared to traditional common law torts, even if not to the same degree. So it's a big ruling in the 11th Circuit now, and if you're sending text messages, this is definitely one you want to keep in mind. Baroness, that was a fantastic breakdown, I've got to say. Yeah, so the law in the 11th Circuit up until about a month ago was from a case called Hannah versus mm -hmm. Salcedo that you just gave us. And it said, look, you get one text message, who cares? <laughs> who cares? That's not an injury. Stop crying, right? That's just like... You know, somebody hands you a flyer you don't want to see when you're walking down the beach or something. Here's a flyer. No, get out of my face. You haven't been harmed. That's not concrete harm. That was the holding of the 11th Circuit. Well, in Drazen, mm -hmm. they got all the other judges in the 11th Circuit, right? So this is how this works. Like an 11th Circuit Court of Appeal ruling, like that's very powerful, right? That is binding. The only way to undo that is either the Supreme Court has to say you're wrong or 
there's three judges on the panel, you're going to go get all the other 10 judges, and so now you've got 13 judges, you're going to get the 13 judges together, and you're going to ask them all, hey, same question, what do you all think, right? And they're going to basically like outvote the three judges, and you can you believe it? They actually did that. It's exactly what they did in a case called Drazen. Um, and now that was a, this is a weird case, guys. This was an appeal from a settlement, and essentially GoDaddy like wanted to settle the case, and so they're, they kind of wanted there to be standing, but ostensibly they were supposed to be arguing the position that there wasn't standing. So as you can imagine, they didn't do, in my opinion, a very good job because they didn't really care. They didn't really want to win. It's a situation where the loser kind of was like, all right, well, I don't care because now my settlement can go through and I'm done with this whole thing and walk away. So it was the weirdest thing where the, the party that was defending the status quo and the law didn't really have a stake. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, all the judges got together and said, you know what, Hannah was wrong. <clears throat> so where does that leave us? Well, that means that in the 11th Circuit footprint now, if you receive one text message, that can be, I would argue, doesn't necessarily cause harm, but it at least can be definitively a concrete harm, which is ironic because the, uh, the Florida... The state of Florida, which is directly within, of course, the 11th Circuit footprint. In fact, it is the biggest population within the 11th Circuit. The state law there now, following okay. Eldridge, mm -hmm. right, versus mm -hmm. PetSmart, is exactly the opposite. Yep. They have held, and this is like the big distinction that, that you raised, right? In Drazen, as you correctly said, it said that the, the corollary um, st uh, common law claim exists in the same type of harm, but not to the same degree. Mm -hmm. In Eldridge, essentially the court said no, you have to have the same type of harm and essentially the same degree in order to have standing, which may or may not be the correct ruling, but that is the ruling right now in Florida. So the Florida state court has one standing requirement now that is much, much higher than the Florida federal court, which has a completely different standard that is much, much lower, and that's Florida for you, <laughs> folks. Thank you. Great job. Good job, Baroness. All right, Tori, throwing it over to you. Yeah, I have a case out of the Seventh Circuit. It is Ambassador V. Alonso, and it's an interesting ruling that came down from a fax case, actually where this fax was sent that essentially offered a free dinner. At this free dinner, they would be solicited uh, services and products of the company. But the fax itself was not advertising any services or goods from the company. So the Seventh Circuit said, it's not advertisement, which essentially goes against the FCC's 2006 ruling that said it didn't matter if it if it subjectively was going to lead to, you know, some kind of solicitation of a good or service from the company, that was enough to make it advertising. And what's even more interesting about this is it kind of goes against the Hobbs Act. I mean, it completely, uh, you know... What's the Hobbs Act, Tori? <laughs> it says that they can't review these sort of uh, rulings from the FCC. Um, that fall under the purview of the Communications Act, which is exactly what this case did. And it is a fascinating ruling. Uh, so the FCC, as you all know, right, that's the government body that implements and regulates the TCPA. Uh, and the TCPA, of course, falls within the Communications Act. There's this other body of law called the Hobbs Act that says essentially district courts cannot question or alter a ruling of the FCC entered under the Communications Act, which the TCPA is a part of. Ergo, the argument follows that you cannot touch an FCC ruling regarding the TCPA, except the Supreme Court says you can in a case called PDR Resources, but there's kind of like a, a two-part analysis that has to take place. It has to be final det agency determination, and you have to determine whether or not the defendant had the ch opportunity under due process to protest the determination at the time it was made, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and the Seventh Circuit was like, nah, I don't care about any of that. I'm going to look at what the law says, and the law says that it has to be black and white on the face of the facts. Either you're offering goods or services, or you're not. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal looked at the facts. Can you imagine these poor judges, right? <laughs> like, you go to like great law schools, you work your whole life to become a, a, a Circuit Court of Appeals judge in the Seventh Circuit, and what do you get to do? We'll read a fax to see if there's marketing in it or not. And that's what they did, right? They, these judges, you know, put their glasses on, they read the thing, and there was no advertisement in the fax. 
And so from their perspective, I think correctly, they applied the law to the facts and there was no advertisement. And the plaintiff said, but, 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 the FCC says that if you had in your mind when you sent the facts that you were intending to market with it, that that is going to be marketing. And the court just basically said, no, that's not what the statute says. I'm not going to pretend that's what the statute says. FCC, I'm not going to give you any deference whatsoever. Get out of my house. Uh, again, probably not the way procedurally it should have worked out, but kind of difficult to argue with the results, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is, the uh, was it the ruling reversed or was the ruling affirmed? I don't remember. Um, I believe it was. Well, you can't believe. you got to know that one <laughs> off the top of your head. Oh, Tori, you failed. Uh, OK, moving on. What did you got, Fuji? OK, guys, so you just Oh, you got the big one. You got the big one. How do you know, you don't even know what's going to come out I know what's going to come out your mouth. I know what you're going to talk know. about. I know what you're going to talk about. I don't know what you're going to talk about. So we just heard Eric break down the huge FTC LinkedIn ruling post. I don't know what to call it anymore, uh, regarding pre-recorded calls and whether you can transfer consent. Now this ruling in the Ninth Circuit, for all you folks in the Ninth Circuit, are gonna make you wonder, can you now transfer consent for text messages under the TSR? Um, and the reason is because in Trim versus New Rewards, the Ninth Circuit took under consideration whether text messages are, uh, can be actionable under the voice, the pre-recorded voice provisions of the TCPA. Now, uh, level setting real quick, we know that you can text messages can be actionable under the TCPA if they are made against the national DNC list, numbers on the DNC list, or if they're made using an ATDS. Um, the pre-recorded technology provision typically does not come into play when you're sending text messages. Um, and what happened here was the plaintiffs argued that the text messages should be uh, actionable under the pre-recorded voice provisions of the TCPA. Fortunately, the court ruled um, no, 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 and the way they got to their conclusion was not relying on the audible definition under the T T TCP in a symbolic way, but really they actually just pulled out a dictionary and looked up what audible meant, and that's how they applied the definition of audible, looking at the text messages, which were essentially just text, right, text words, with no uh, audio to them, the Ninth Circuit said, you know, these are not text messages that should be governed under the TCPA's pre-recorded voice provisions. And that's it. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> you were ready to talk. I saw you. Um, well, so the fact that the court had looked deeply into the audible provision or the definition of what an audio is, right, it makes you think, right? Voice. And, voice, sorry, voice. Um, makes you think, you know, for the folks who are sending MMS messages, right, folks these days aren't just relying on simple text messages. They're sending, you know, YouTube videos, MMS, uh, things with actual voice, you know, links, whatever it may be. So now you really have to think under the Ninth Circuit, right, if you're a text message, sure, it's a text message, but are you sending some kind of video that has audio with it? Um, and looking at it under the lens of the trim case now, you know, to me, it, it falls clearly within the purview of the court's uh, decision that if you have audio to your text messages, then the pre-recorded voice provision of the TCP would be it. Well, I don't know if clearly, I wouldn't try to say clearly, but I'd look. be careful, I would advise you. got to be careful. Yeah. you, you got to be careful. So, so, you know, Pooja, I think you did a great job, but so looking at whether or not a pre-recorded voice, right, and, and footnote four of Trim, I love these footnotes, you know I always love footnotes, basically says, hey look, you know, this text message didn't have an audible component, but if you're using MMS, Hey, look, maybe maybe it is maybe, maybe right, yeah. uh, and so the Ninth Circuit didn't make a ruling on it, but it certainly held open the door. Okay. So you know, if you are sending text messages that have an audio component mm -hmm. that include an embedded uh, you know, video, um, you really got to be thinking to yourself: Is this suddenly a pre-recorded call? And if it is a pre-recorded call, you've got all the content requirements with pre-recorded mm -hmm. calls too. In addition to the requirement, of course, to have express written consent or express consent, depending on how it's being sent. Uh, in addition it's a really big to deal. the guidance now with the TSR as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, the overlay of that you can't use those even with the yeah, with with consent that's been transferred yeah, for it, marketing purposes. It, it's scary, right, to think that text messages now can be as scary or as dangerous as the traditional pre-recorded calls that we're usually warning folks to stay away from. I think most folks will be using consent to send most forms of messages. Yeah. Those of you that are using human selection systems, you can't be using these MMS messages. And really, where it hurts people the most. And maybe this is you know good news, bad news. I don't know, depending on where you fall on the spectrum. But but political messaging, 
right? I mean, political messaging, typically you don't need consent to send a manual P2P or uh, you know, otherwise non-ATDS text message. Right. Uh, and folks send these embedded videos, right? I, your local candidate, need your support. I, Eric Troutman, do need your support. Think about it. Um, but you know, that's a big change for these folks. And more importantly, under the mini TCPAs, the definition of an auto dialer or a dialer typically includes uh, dialing systems that have the capacity to send pre-recorded calls or text, mess text messages in this case, or um, actually disseminate the pre-recorded message. So, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how if states actually take upon this ruling and kind of adjust their guidance under the mini TCPAs as well. Brilliant stuff. Tori, I've decided it was affirmed. That's where I think we landed affirmed, on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but Pooja, great job there. Um, was trim affirmed or was that reversed? That was affirmed as that well. Was affirmed that affirmed. was affirmed as well. That was affirmed as well. And we know that Drazen was reversed. So, uh, great stuff, ladies. I'm excited to get to the interview. Should we get to the interview? Let's do it. All right. Now, through the power of the Trumpman Amin LLP firm, we bring you an interview with the CEO of UMail, Alex Quilici. And now, through the power of the Troutman Amin LLP law firm, I'm incredibly excited to introduce to the show Alex Quilici, the CEO of UMail. Welcome, Alex. Well, thank you for having me on your show. I'm excited to be here. Now, man, you are a monster. It is absolutely our honor to have you here. Uh, why don't we just give the folks at home, I think they kind of everyone kind of knows who you are and what UMail does, but just in case, uh, can you just kind of give a high level of what is who is UMail and who is Alex Quilici? Uh, sure. So UMail is a call blocking app that tries to prevent unwanted calls from reaching consumers, along with uh, a service for carriers and enterprises to try to help them stop originating illegal calls or be negatively impacted by illegal calls. So we've kind of branched out from consumers to also the B2B side. Uh, I'm the okay. CEO of UMail. My background is telephony. Uh, we did Siri 10 years before Apple did Siri, but we did it old school style where you called a 1-800 number and talked about what you wanted. That was my prior back okay. background. Uh, well, so, I mean, UMail, I think, is most famous because you, you folks have created the robocall index that everybody watches so carefully to see kind of what's going on with robocalls. Are they going up? Are they going down? Um, I brought you on the show. Uh, because really, I want to talk about the, the robocall index and it's dropping. And of course, I just want to take credit for that. Uh, <laughs> but there's quite quite a few other things that we need to talk through. But, but why don't you just kind of orient folks like, what is the robocall index and how did you come up with that? So the robocall index is an estimate of volumes of robocalls in different regions from the country as a whole to states to cities and different types of robocalls like what are scams, what's telemarketing, what's like a notification, etc. We came up with it because we wanted to figure out a way to track progress against robocalls or lack of progress, depending on what was going on. And we realized that with you know, 10 million plus people at the time who downloaded our app, we had a really great statistical sample of what's going on in the robocall space. And so we decided to publish it and it's sort of gone way beyond our wildest dreams. We just thought it'd be cool to have and start discussion. And now, you know, law enforcement uses it and regu regulators use it and everybody uses it. And it's really just a really good, good faith estimate based on what we're seeing and extrapolating to, to the country as a whole in different regions. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, it's like the, the UMail robocall index has become like the source of truth. For anybody that wants to know what the volume of robocalls is in this country, and that that might just be, that's just wild, Alex. That like you are the guy that everyone looks to for that. Did did you see that coming? Were you expecting that? Well, I have a background in stats, so I knew that the statistics were going to be pretty good. Like it certainly whatever we saw, what, there was no reason to believe it wasn't directionally correct, right? And as long as we were kind of scaling it correctly, that was going to be a pretty good measure of what was there. And I think because we did it, everybody said, okay, let's start using it. And a lot of folks started looking at their own numbers within carriers and stuff and told us, yeah, your estimates seem pretty good. Are they exact? No, but they're close enough and you're definitely there directionally. Well, I love that. So, so robocalls in this country generally, and again, you know, you and I have talked many times about the need to disambiguate the different kinds of robocalls, right? From the true scam calls, the IRS scam calls to, you know, maybe calls that you consider to be spam, but might be honest 
uh, you know, outreach by a marketer to calls that are truly informational, not even pre-recorded, but some people will still consider those to be, uh, you know, live calls to be uh, robocalls. And then ultimately you got your, your, your alerts, right? Your low balance alerts and notifications. And, and, you know, all of those are to some degree encompassed within uh, the robocall index, which is basically looking at high volume calling patterns. Is that right? So it's, yeah, the robocall index, basically when a, when a call comes in, we decide if we think it's an automatically dialed call. Sometimes there's obvious clues that left a pre-recorded message. Okay, for sure. Uh, it's, the, it's a campaign that we know is hitting lots of different numbers from the same source. Those are robocalls. So it's kind of the, the walks like a duck, quacks like a duck theory of, of, of recognizing these robocalls. And that, that's Excellent. our model. So we built a deep, put a pretty good effort into trying to, to recognize what's a robocall and what isn't. And so I think we peaked, like, what do we peak at? Like at 7 billion uh, robocalls a month, a, a couple months ago, or what, what, where are we at, Alex? Well, the real peak was October of 2019, where it was somewhere like 5.8 billion robocalls by our estimate, which was, you know, it's just completely crazy, right? Uh, we've had some months in the mid fives, I think five and maybe five, three recently, and then it dropped quite a bit the last couple of months. But there's a ton of things that affect that number, just like how many days in a month? Like you'd expect February to be 10% less than average just because there's three less days. Are there holidays? Are there more weekend days in a given month? That, you know, there's 10 weekend days versus eight. It can bounce around, right? Depending on when the first of the month, you know, what day that lies on. So there are some sort of generic factors, but the bigger thing is directional. So the fact it bounced back was real. The fact that it's dropping again feels real. And the fact that it plateaued for a while was, was real. Yeah, so from my perspective, right, I look at these numbers through the lens of my own personal efforts to, to quash robocalls. As you know, we, we created the Responsible Enterprises Against Consumer Harassment, which is a group of, of lead buyers that were basically putting standards on lead sellers. In addition to just like Queenie and I's general really hard push the last few years to get to the lead suppliers out there, right, the, the lead generators uh, who, are, who are selling data, selling phone numbers to companies that end up making outbound calls and reliance on those sale, uh, those sold that sold data and really pushing them to comply with the TCPA to set limits on the number of times that the lead might be sold to make the, the lead process more transparent, to, to stop aged leads, right? To really trim down the number of times that, that a consumer is going to receive a phone call when they fill out an online form. And I got to say, like, I'm not ready to declare victory yet, but when I start seeing the directionally the trends, right, especially on the telemarketing, the percentage of, of that, that robocalls that are, are now attributable to telemarketing and seeing that month over month decline again directionally there's you know it goes up a little bit but like overall this thing is headed down and it seems to be from a timing perspective at least to completely correlate with our efforts you know can i can i prove causation i cannot <laughs> but i'm just curious alex i mean do, do you you know kind of the, the the mastro of all things kind of robocall wizardry i mean do you have anything that you're attributing it to other of course than my fine efforts which i know you don't dispute so uh, I don't want to disappoint you. I think your efforts are contributing, but I think there are bigger trends that are making a bigger difference. So when you look at the numbers as a whole, uh, you can see them going down. So the question is why? And the biggest thing that's gone down are scam calls, right? So scam calls have gone down really dramatically. I think last month it was like six or 700 million for the month. And there were times even two years ago, we we're at 2 billion plus. So wow. that's a huge trend that accounts for a ton of the decline. In fact, almost more of the decline than there was a decline. So we have to talk about the other parts. And what's driving that is a couple of things. One is enforcement. Enforcement is going after the biggest and the baddest scammers, right? But another thing that's driving it is they're getting a lot smarter. So it used to be you'd uh, have one number, you'd make 100 million calls to go find the million 65 pluses you wanted to do a Medicare scam on, right? Now you get a list and you go, well, let me get a list of a million 65 pluses and I'm going to try to scam them directly. So you make one one hundredth the number of calls and you're just as effective. In fact, you might even be more effective because you just call those people over and over again as opposed to randomly calling people. And we can see huge trends in that regard with the scammers. They're getting data from breaches and then just calling the breach. If you want to try to scam a, a Chase cardholder, well, the best thing to do is you have a Chase cardholder's database with a phone number, an address, a name, social security number, so you can seem like you're really Chase, right? And I'm not picking on Chase. That's just an example. But that's what's happening. So 
uh, the the fact that they had to move to stir shake and make, you can just make up numbers and call as much. You're going to call less, but you're going to make it much more targeted. So that's probably the biggest driver, along with enforcement going after the really big ones, the billion plus callers, right? That you see those actions and they're they're whether or not they ever collect the fine, they are shutting them down. The carriers right. they used are down, the 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 whole robocall operations are down, the people are supposedly signing decrees are never gonna do robocalls again. That matters too. So you've got a trend of scam calls going down, but maybe scam impact not going down. On the rest yeah, of the, the robocall, oh go ahead. Oh, so the government's working hard. Don't get me wrong, but of course I'm working harder uh, <laughs> now. But 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 in truth, I mean, and I love always kind of highlighting, you know, UMail's role in this entire ecosystem because although I certainly would push back on some of the things the government is doing uh, on on especially you know when it's interpreting rules retroactively and doing some odd things, I'm fully supportive, of course, of of shutting down the scammers, right? The guys who are the real bad guys, and and I always love talking to you because UMail has a really interesting vantage point, a really interesting perch uh, in that overall ecosystem because, you know, much of the information that the FCC, the FTC, and the DOJ works from comes from the industry traceback group's efforts, right, through their traceback program. And one of the biggest, um, you know, igniters of a, a traceback uh, ticket process is UMail, right? UMail is a great contributor to help the ITG to find people that they should be looking into when it comes to identifying fraudulent uh, traffic. So that that's right, although I, I frame it a little bit differently. So we're monitoring everything, right? So we have the robocall index, which we publish, but we also are looking at every single robocall campaign that's out there, right? And we're looking at the volume and who they're calling and how they're working, all that stuff. And we pro provide reports, you know, for a fee to different parties, including, you know, folks at the traceback group and others. So they can look at that report and say, okay, the student loan stuff is out of control. There's 58 of these campaigns. They're making 40 million calls. They're calling a very targeted audience. Let's do something to shut them down. Then they can come to us and say, can you give us, your, your user base is a giant sensor network, right? So forget honeypots. I mean, we have real consumers getting real calls all the time. Can you give us specific examples of these campaigns? We, the government or whoever will tell us this is illegal. We, we will vouch that it's illegal. So can you send us some data to help us shut it down? Um, so, for example, if it's claiming to be the Department of Education, it's not calling. OK, it's it's clearly fraud. Right. So we feel very comfortable giving them data. They then trace back to find the source and then do their magic from there of having the carrier find the customer and figuring out who to go after. And, you know, sometimes shutting down the carrier, sometimes shutting down the customer. So that's our role in this is really helping provide the data that enables smart decision making about what to go after and then providing data that allows them to go after it in a really effective way. Are you surprised uh, by some of the um, actions that the FCC has taken recently, shutting down carriers like Global UC or Earth Access? Um, or is that, do you think, look, this just had to happen? It's just kind of a natural uh, progression? Or, or maybe you don't even have an opinion on that kind of from your perch, but I was curious. Well, no, I mean, I think it's a question of is the carrier a good guy or a bad guy. So at a really high level, a good guy carrier is trying to do a good job. They're looking obvious fraud, they're shutting down. They're probably enforcing some sort of KYC. They're observing their traffic to some degree. They're, they're trying to help, right? I think it's nuts to shut one of those down. But when you have these carriers where you look at their traffic and 90% of it is calling illegal robocalling campaigns and there's maybe one good one in there and there's a bunch of law that the government can use here, right? Regulations and stuff. It seems silly not to apply it in those cases. And then you end up with the gray line somewhere in between. And I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know where the right place to draw it is. But when well, I look I at them shutting lawyer. down. I don't know where the line is either. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem, right? Is no one can tell. Like, what, what, is, what is it that a carrier has to do to avoid liability, to avoid being shut down? You're right. It looks so far, maybe, as if the commission's mostly looking at extreme cases, although uh, with with Global UC, for instance, it was just like you failed to update your mitigation database protocol and respond to our email. It was almost like one of these like bureaucratic like library you know failures to return the library book on time. So then it just like shut them down. Now I understand that was probably a pretext because what was really going on was like it was, there was a bunch of scams and the FCC knew it, so they just kind of relied on this little odd procedure to shut them down. Uh, but anyway, it, your point I think is well taken. Um, but in, when you're looking for the line, though, between a carrier who's who's really doing something bad and a carrier who's trying to do good, 
Uh, I know you email, you're saying you've got this process now where you can help carriers to, to look at fraud and prevent it. That's right. So we, carriers can basically give us all their telephone numbers and we'll tell them what we're seeing. It's like, well, we're seeing fraud on this set of telephone numbers and it's not campaigns that are spoofing, which means it's a number you own that you've given to somebody who's originating illegal traffic. What do you want to do about it? And usually they ask for that so they can shut it down. That's ideal, right? Because it's extremely targeted. And that's that's one of the products that's having some real success. We have another one for wholesale carriers where all the CDRs flow to us. And we're looking at the CDRs to bump them against our day and saying, here are CDRs you need to investigate, right? Like they're misbehaving. They're, they're, they're examples of misbehaving. And then the carrier can investigate and see what's going on. So our data can act as a real-time uh, filter for the carriers and a real time, and it's almost like surveillance thing, but that's the wrong word, like microscope that shines the light on exactly where the problem is. It's finding the needles in the haystack. You're giving out 2 million numbers as a carrier you know, that are live. Maybe only 2,000 are causing problems, but you need to know. And you can't just say, oh, it's a short duration call because there's plenty of legal short duration calls. But yeah, this is actually acting like the Social Security Administration. I think you should shut it down. If you refuse to shut that down, then the government has to take the, the next step. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I mean, I, I love what you're saying, right? Because short duration calls, as an example, that's like one of the various pieces of the data that the reasonable analytics, right, driving the algorithms in terms of unwanted calls versus wanted calls. But it's only one piece of data. And to your point, right, those could be perfectly legal. So, so what do you do if you're a carrier that actually wants to allow valid traffic and shut down the bad traffic? And I'm glad that, that email has like a feedback loop that you're creating with really good data to allow people to be very, very targeted in the decisions that they're making. Because, you know, one of the big complaints right now, you know, we're about to pivot over to labeling, but it is it's over blocking, right? And, and you know, I, I personally think there's about to be a lot of litigation, a lot of litigation with legitimate calls that are being blocked from legitimate businesses who have consent to talk with the consumer. Um, and those traffic, you know, text messages, as an example, is not getting through because the carriers are blocking. And it feels like email might like, be able to help, you know, to, to, to you know, give the, the carrier some additional intelligence so they're not blocking perfectly consented calls. So we are doing some of that mostly through enterprises. So what we can do is watch a set of numbers an enterprise is using and say, hey, this number is misbehaving, but it's probably spoofing. Like this campaign is all over. Your number is being used for some spoofing. So you can go to your carrier and say, don't block this. It's don't block our legitimate calls. It was used for spoofing right. for three days. So we have a lot of data that we can help with the remediation process. And we're starting to provide services to do that. So I think I think that's one place we play a good role in helping legitimate traffic get through. But I got to tell you, I have a personal interest in this. My home phone has been scam likely now for the better part of 40 days. So and I know what happened. My wife called me, my daughter and my son all trying to get me to do something right like three or four times really quickly. And boom, it's scam likely and it doesn't go off. And as a consumer, I can't do anything. Now, imagine you're a business. Multiply that by 100 times or 1,000 times. It's brutal and it's wrong. There was never, I mean, it was short duration calls, right? <laughs> Voicemail answer. I'm not going to leave a message. He's not going to do anything. Call again, call again, call again. And looks like some sort of scammer attacking from a frontier VoIP phone or whatever. And they made the wrong <laughs> decision. So I see that personally, those wrong decisions. I see my doctor coming in as spam, as, uh, spam likely. I'm sure we all have had examples of really legitimate calls mislabeled. And now none of us want to answer calls anyways, and you're never going to answer a spam likely call, right? You are 100% right. I'm glad that we're talking about this. Look, I, this is an honest to God, completely true story. Just yesterday, I received a call and it was you know spam telemarketing. That was the label, <laughs> spam telemarketing. Not might be spam, might, you know, scam like, no, spam telemarketing. It was opposing counsel giving <laughs> me notice of a very important motion that I did not receive. It went to my voicemail. I didn't pick it up till the next day because I'm not going to listen to the voicemail even of the spam, right? Like, like, so it's not just I don't pick up the phone. Now I've got a voicemail left, and the only thing it says is spam telemarketing voicemail. I'm not going to listen to that. I listened to it today. Guess what? It was notice that opposing counsel was giving me. That is a really really big deal um and that's what i want to talk with you about also alex is so our friends over at numerical who i have not had a chance to have on the podcast yet but i think we're gonna have them on next week and so you're gonna get to go first which i think is really cool um they have filed 
just a momentous comment. Like it's 45 pages and it's just like lighting people up. And the overall allegation, I'm going to say it's an allegation because it feels like an allegation, um, is that the third party analytics engines that the carriers are working with, right? The highs of the world, hey, uh, and the, uh, the first Orions of the world, right? Uh, they are essentially, dare I say, deliberately, deliberately over labeling because these same companies that are feeding the analytics that determine the labeling also sell the keys to not be labeled, right? So you've got a company that makes money selling white li listing services and remediation services for false and incorrect labeling, and they're the ones that are doing the labeling. And so as Numerical points out, like this is this is the old protection scheme, right? <laughs> Mafia comes down to your tomato skin and says, you know, Sure would be a shame if something were to happen to your business, you know, why don't you give them a little money to make sure that we take care of it. And it's the same kind of thing. Sure would be a shame if, uh, you know, somebody were to label your calls as a scam, Tori, and you're like, but aren't you the one that labels my calls as a scam? They're like, yeah, I guess we are. So uh, how about <laughs> yeah. a little cashish? Um, what are your thoughts on this, man? Like, again, you, you're, you're got, you got a really interesting vantage point over there at UMail. I'm just really curious. I think it's problematic, right? I mean, it's breaking windows in order to sell re replacement windows, right? So I, I I don't know if I have a great solution though, because um, you do branded calling is a good thing in some ways. I mean, it, the fact is that you you guaranteed the name shows up with the phone number when you call, ideally with an intent and a logo. That's kind of a good thing. So there's likely some value to it, right? But the way you're getting people to do it is. It's not just that you go from an unknown state to this state you paid for in terms of how you appear in front of the consumer. You go from something that says, don't answer me. <laughs> and right. that's the problem. And there, if you put don't answer me on enough people and their calls can't get through, they get desperate and say, okay, I need to show up. And that's where I struggle with the, with the whole idea. The, the other problem though with branded calling is, I, I don't know about you guys, but I get the, I'm T-Mobile, so I get the little green check mark on certain numbers. Oddly, I don't get the green check mark on my family when they call, right? Even though they're, <laughs> my kids are T-Mobile. I don't get it from other people I know. I don't get it from my doctor. I don't get it from you know the, the car place. I get it from a scammers pretending to be a large streaming service that are calling me to tell me that my subscription's up. So the green check mark is soured me with, the wrong, with the, a wrong name and a validation indication. So I think yeah. there's a bunch of problems with whether branded calling can even be executed in a meaningful way that's going to work and do what they want. Well, so, from my perspective, the solution is simple, isn't it? Don't label people's calls, right? Like it is, there's a, there's a body of law in this country and it's called defamation and libel, right? And if you are labeling somebody, um, you know, that is potentially actionable. And if you're, you know, having damages arising from the fact that you're saying something's a spam or a scam or it's marketing when it's not, Right. People get harmed by that. They've got a private right of action. It, it's weird to me that there hasn't been just a ton of lawsuits against the carriers and the analytics engines for mislabeling. And I get it. They'll probably say, well, it's an opinion. All right. But to me, it's not an opinion. Like you are stating a fact. You are saying this is something that it is not. And people are relying on that to their detriment. Well, I think if people opt in, it's different than if people have to opt out. So if you opt into a service, you're like our service, you're asking us to be your agent to try to tell you what to answer, right? What to let through, what to send a voicemail, what to block. You, you've entrusted us, right? You said, I'm going to have you guys do that. I opted in. We, we let them know. We have ways they can correct things. It's all, all done very explicitly. If it's default and it's just happening, then it's much more of a problem because people aren't educated as to what's going on. They've never opted in and said, I really want this. I trust that you're going to make these decisions. So I think a bit of it is opt in versus opt out. But to flip it to the other side for a minute, if I'm letting a call through, let's say it's Gmail, that I know is a TCPA violation. Right. So it doesn't have the opt out number. It's calling it with a, like a, a local TCP where you have the hours you can call. It's doing something like that. We have the content. So we know this number is marketing. We've got shaken and stir. So we know it's really not being spoofed. Should I be able to say spam likely? 
It is, right? I mean, should I say TCPA violation? So there's times where you have enough information that you can actually help the consumer by putting that label there versus showing the label of some solar company, let's say, where they're not sure that this is a violation or likely to be problematic. So there, there are arguments both ways here. I think opt-in solves it. I think probably not charging <laughs> um, if you're actually for mislabel, like correcting labels, like you should be able to get to unknown and decide if you want to live with unknown. There should be a really simple path to go there. Like you demonstrate you're not doing anything illegal with that number if someone's labeled you that, like a faster remediation process. We're, we're trying to contribute that by watching. So at least you can see what the content is and understand what's going on. To, to be fair, though, an awful lot of numbers we see from really, I mean, they're legitimate, large Fortune 500 companies doing telemarketing. They are violating the law in one way or another in terms of regulations. The TSR, I mean, uh, TCPA, we have our users at scale saying no consent. I didn't consent to this call to the, these kind of calls. Now, the user could be wrong, but if it's one user out of 50, Okay, probably wrong, 45 out of 50. There's a problem. Even if you've right. got legal consent, you don't have, you know, sort of the real consumer consent. Like the, it may have been a lead sold or something like that. And the consumer is just saying, look, you, you guys shouldn't be calling me. Yeah, now, I mean, and, and, and that's the other thing. Look, I, I am completely in support of a private backstop to help enforce the law. And so if the standard was thou shalt label or block illegal calls or or you can block or label illegal calls like you just described right we've got clear data demonstrating this campaign violates the tsr period okay the czar approves in fact i wrote tcpa version 2.0 and sent it off to congress and said this is what you should pass right a clear standard in terms of what's lawful and unlawful and the carrier should back that but the problem, as you know, is the carriers now have no rubric on block, on call labeling at all, none. And the only rubric they have on call blocking is thou shalt use reasonable analytics not to detect illegal calls, but to detect unwanted calls. And so the carriers now sit in the mindset of their network users and are censoring speech based upon their subjective belief as to what the user would want. That is madness. That is absolute madness. And from my perspective, it, that is completely unconstitutional. There's no question it's unconstitutional. It's an illegal licensing scheme. It plainly is not lawful. But to your point, you know, where there is ind indication, not that the calls might be might be unwanted, decided by some egghead somewhere, but really is illegal based upon a clear set of standards. Yes, I'm behind that. Right. I support that because that's just now the private backstopping of a governmental determined policy, which is fine. Um, but. Let, let's move off that unless you want the last word. I'm happy to kind of give that to you. But I was going to pivot over now to the, the consent. You brought up consent and leads. And man, the FTC's telemarketing sweep and what a change. Um, just to kind of orient folks, you know, historically, of course, the FTC is the, is the organization, uh, the regulator that can enforce the TSRs, the telemarketing sales rules, up until about three weeks ago. They just never did, or they, they rarely did. And when they did, it was really just looking after at, at real fraud. Um, but just a couple of weeks ago, they've announced what they're calling a telemarketing sweep. And essentially, they're going after companies that are making outbound calls in reliance on what they're calling consent farms. But what you would recognize, or at least most of us would consider to be just lead generation websites. Now, some of these lead generation websites are using dark patterns. They're not exactly above, uh, you know, acting in the, in the consumer's best interest at all. Uh, but what's fascinating, I'm really interested in your take, Alex, is that the FTC's position on consent has really in, uh, evolved. Um, you know, the case law and industry practice certainly has been that you can transfer consent. Uh, the FTC's stated position recently was that you can transfer consent, but only a single seller can be identified in that consent. And then most recently, as we talked about earlier in the show, in the craziest event that I can think of, of a regulator using social media to, to regulate uh, on their LinkedIn account, they announced for the first time ever that you can't sell or transfer a lead at all if it's going to be used for a pre-recorded marketing call. Just a wild series of events evolving incredibly quickly. You know, the, the case law, sorry, the, the telemarketing law, the telecom law in this country getting written seemingly on the back of a napkin via social media uh, happening in real time. Really curious, Alex, kind of, from, again, from your vantage point as the CEO of Umail, like, what are you thinking of all this? 
Well, I, I try to figure out what the motivation is, like why this huge change is happening. And if you look at the cases that have gotten to where they're finding people now, right, especially like the car warranty ones and uh, the health insurance ones and some of these where it was billions of calls. One reason those took so long to shut down was a claim of consent, right? You know, the, the calls actually look to behave like every other aspect of TSR and TCPA. They're good. Do they have consent? They showed consent. Yeah, there's some website they made up and yeah, this is so-and-so's consent. Here, I mean, there were email users involved here, right? Like, here's another one. Yeah, they gave consent. They did. And so the problem is, what do you do to kind of expose quickly whether or not consent is there? Well, the easiest thing to do is, you know, one kid misbehaves, you punish the whole class. And so we'll just not allow you to have any consent that isn't absolutely directly from that entity because that's super easy to tell if you, you did it or not right? Like it's an easy subpoena. It's not, well, it was five sides down and was it legal? So I, I think there's a lot of reasons that's problematic. I bought my daughter a Jeep a year ago, went to what Cars Direct, True Caller, put in a put in a email, second line phone number, put in a phone number, and I'm expecting to get calls from five or six local dealers. I want those calls, right? So that part's good. And I don't know which dealer has a good deal on the Jeep, just whoever wants to sell me, right? Yeah. But I don't want the, the three insurance calls I got. Right. That's problematic because right. I am not shopping for insurance. I didn't want the solar thing in case I guess I bought an electric car. I need solar. I, there was clearly that lead went beyond what I wanted. And so I think it's a really hard problem. And so let's take the biggest possible hammer to try to fix it versus trying to figure out other solutions. I mean, you could imagine a solution, which is every call you make, you have to have the consent on file electronically, easily grabbable by a thir uh, recognized third party. So if someone complains, nope, there's the consent. Was that you? Yes, no. Yep, it was. Okay, they had consent. No, okay, maybe now we've got an issue to investigate. There's some technology you could build to try to address this. And, and we started with, let's ask our users, every time they report something is spam, did you consent to it? Yeah. And there's times yeah. that reporting is spam, like, yeah, this credit card company is calling you too much, but I consented to it, it's fine. Great, that's really a great signal to us. But when you see other ones where it's, you know, payment reminders that no, I never consented, never consented, never consented, it's like, well, that's a signal that this debt collector probably bought the debt from someone, got the consent some other way. They're not behaving in a way that people are accepting their calls. We've got to do something about it. So it's just, it's yeah. a really hard problem. And it's the thing that's bedeviled moving quickly. And if you look at what they're trying to do now, it's moved much, much, much faster, right? Carrier yeah. misbehaves, hammer on the carrier. Large campaign, we want to shut it down. And the thing is, you're not seeing the billion robocall campaigns anymore. We used to see tons of campaigns making 150, 200 million calls a month, like calling every adult in America once in a month, right? That was common. Now the biggest campaigns are 40, the illegal ones are 40, 50 million calls, like the, the Google business listing campaign and some of the ZRC stuff is pretty sketchy. I suspect that's mostly illegal and calling without consent. So there are some campaigns, but it's down quite a bit, like one third the size, one fourth the size or more. Yeah, but it means remarkable. And you give a great example, right? Comparison shopping websites. These things are, are very well known, like the LendingTrees.coms of the world. They're, they're kind of beloved to consumers. Consumers know how to use them. They actually deliver great value to a consumer. Um, and then other websites that people don't think of as lead generation websites, but that, but that are like, like a Zillow, right? Uh, or a Redfin. Like, well, how do you think you get all this free information available to you, America? It's because they're selling information, data, and consents that you provide two other interested parties who are going to pay for them. That's how that they're able to give you all this free stuff. Um, so what, what really bothers me is that, you know, the FCC is trying to do this via an MPRM. The FTC, the FTC is just coming in, just like shutting everything down, like, like just wild without any thought, it seems like to me. Like this is the first time these regulators have even tried for a second, right, to, to, to stop what is really the root cause, in my opinion, of most of the unwanted telemarketing calls in the country is the lead generation world. Without question, therefore, it needs regulation. But you know, the government, to me, it comes in, right? Johnny come lately, he finally figures this out, probably because of my blog, to be honest. They probably just follow the, the crumbs that I left behind for them to come come, come find these guys. Um, and, and that's fine. Like, it, this industry needs regulation. It needs standards. I mean, I'm the guy that created Reach specifically to give the industry standards. So I'm not going to say it doesn't shouldn't be regulated. It should be regulated, or it should have very tight government, or sorry, uh, self-regulatory standards. But what shouldn't happen is what is, it appears is going to happen is that the government comes down and says, oh, well, you guys are a problem. You're all shut down. 
right? And that seems to be what they're doing. They're just going to shut the entire thing down. Like you can't, you know, I'm not going to get the standard that there has to be a clear disclosure and you can only sell it five times over a certain period of time. And then only, you know, a couple of phone calls can be made. No, no, we're just going to say you can't sell consent at all, period. Problem solved, which on the one hand, I suppose is efficient and we should compliment the government for being efficient for the first time in its life. Uh, but on the other hand, it is absolute overkill. And these guys really do not understand what the, what the permutations are going to be in terms of the number of people that are laid off, in terms of the number of businesses that fail. And then on the other side of the equation, right, consumers who lose the right to choose and small mom and pop shops or, or local Jeep dealerships who could pay to be able to contact a guy in their area that, that's looking to buy a Jeep that now would no longer have that available to them. And let's say they can't afford to do a, a fancy ad right at the John Wayne airport like we can or, or on television, right? Uh, that's a really big deal for a lot of companies. I just think the, the, the reverberations here are gonna be absolutely massive. So I think part of the problem, aside from it's the panic to try to solve a big problem, right? Um, it's also actually a big problem that was getting worse because what's happening with the telemarketers are because they're not getting through. And even the the notifi legal notifi notification people and the payment reminders are not getting through. They're making more calls and they're starting to do the scammer tricks of, well, I'm going to get a local number in 10,000 different places and I'm going to call low volumes. And so the volumes have gone up. So it feels like not only have they not been able to stop the problem, it's actually getting worse. And so that's driving this need to do action. But they're not stepping back and saying, well, what technology could solve this? Like the reassigned number database is a pretty good example of something that's a burden, but it's a slight burden on calling. Before you call something, see if the number changed. Okay, not, not that hard, right? You know, it's easy to maintain that database. I, mean, I know there are issues, but it's pretty good. So they haven't stopped to say, well, what's the, I've consented to the call database and come up with some technological requirement that before you call this, you put the consent in a database that everybody can get to and figure out the details of that. Like there's a lot of places where once you understand what technology can do, it's a win. Nobody knew you could trace back calls until David Frankel built a trace back engine, right? Sorry. Great. I understand there's always issues with that, but it's a great thing, right? It's like now we can find out who's doing it. But then they're like, well, we need to know the call's illegal. Well, email can do that for us. And there's all these different pieces that I think can solve the problem problem and get it to be something that works for everybody versus just let's shut it all down. And I agree, if I buy a car, I actually want to get my phone number out. I want to get the calls. It saves me a bunch of time versus emailing 10 times. And there's tons of examples we've all had of that. So it, it is tough. I, I, you know, you, you guys will know what will stand up and what won't. From our perspective, it doesn't cha really change how we act on things. Right. Yeah. So it's it's really for us. Does it look like it's TSR? Does it look like it's TCPA? Are we getting lots of consumer complaints? What's going on? Those are our signals. And they're really, really good ones. We won't know yeah, about it, where they got the consent. It, it's frustrating to be the czar, right? Because for me, it's like everything is so simple. It's also easy. I don't know why people just don't listen to what I say, right? We, we set clear standards in Congress on the TCPA. You enable good companies like Umail and others to use technological solutions to be a private backstop to prevent illegal calls. And then you dictate a very clear standard around consent, right? Maybe it's three, maybe it's five, whatever it is in terms of the number of times consent can be transferred. You just dictate it, make it very straightforward and, and highly regulated. And then very quickly, just a few little change, 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 do require some fraud detection on third party leads. That's very important. There's a lot of fraud out there. And all of a sudden, pretty much every single call that a consumer receives from that day forward is a wanted expected call, right? Like how hard is that? Meanwhile, industry still exists. It can still put up comparison shopping websites. Consumers can still hear from companies that they want to hear from. Companies that want to buy leads can still pay a little bit of money for a very hopefully targeted, uh, you know, well-qualified lead that, that wants their product or service. And it's all good. But instead, we have this ridiculous world where no one knows what the TCPA covers, where the, the carriers can block essentially whoever the hell they want, or we're just going to stop comparison shopping websites altogether because we just can't come up with another idea. It's like, guys, like spend 35 seconds thinking about this. Just read TCPA world. Just, just watch my little podcast. I will explain all of telecom policy in the United States. I'll make it very simple. But I appreciate you, Alex, stepping in and saying, look, as a technology solution provider, yeah, we can help, right? Like, stop making this more complicated than it needs to be. Stop shutting down small businesses where we can just lean on technology to identify the unwanted. <laughs> I misspoke. The illegal calls, right? Because that's what we should be doing. 
No, I agree fully. And I, I think that's why some of the processes have been pretty good that the FCC is doing. Like the miracles response is a great response, right? The FCC is saying, what do we do about labeling? And they got it. We respond. They got a ton of responses. And that's what they need to do for each of these things to see what might be out there that you've never thought about. And I think that's critical. And so before regulation comes, I really am a fan of let's go through a process. And then once regulation's there, let's enforce it. Let's do all of that good stuff. But take your time. It's it's not going to matter if it takes six months or a year to get a solution here. Uh, most of the damage has already been done to the phone network and the reputation. It's, you know, if you look out a few years, is branded calling really going to get people to answer when they're habituated that your phone rings, it stays in your pocket? I, I don't know, right? I, I think it may be a little bit bit too late already and there's going to be other tools that people end up having to use that that is the sad thing right now currently i mean the state of of the mindset in, in america is we don't answer our phones anymore and people are engineering alternate contact strategies like technologies for alternate contact because people don't answer their phone and there's nothing better in life really than human connection right i mean short of being able to teleport and hang out with puja right like getting on the phone and talking to Pooja is the next best thing, right? And I don't pick up my phone, so good luck. And people are afraid, yeah, exactly. People are afraid to do that. <laughs> well, um, and my kids Alex, don't even know how to make phone calls, other than they call me because I have an Android phone that they use FaceTime audio for everybody else in their life, right? So I, I'm keeping an Android phone just to force them to have to learn how to dial a phone number and let it ring <laughs> and talk to people. But it's, I mean, you're seeing a whole generation of people with the phone call, it just isn't relevant. Right, which is really, it's like you said, it's really scary or, and sad. Is a business going to do FaceTime audio? Probably not, right? I mean, what are we going to do here? And it's, and by the way, it's just going to get worse. So live voicemail is showing up on iOS 17, which is taking the answering machine and putting on your phone with a transcription, right? So now, in theory, people can scan their calls and all that. What's actually happening, and we're seeing data on this, is... Uh, Friends don't leave voicemails now just because you have live voicemail. They didn't leave voicemails before. It's like, oh, crap, I got to hang up and call, you know, text you, right? But the scammers are going nuts because now if you're pretending to be an enterprise, like you're going to pretend to be Bank X, right? You can just talk. I'm Bank X. There's a problem with your account. There's a $200 transaction. Please press one right now so that we don't let it through. Now you've got this real-time thing of the only things you're actually seeing are from the scammers. Right. And that's just when people realize that it's just going to be, I don't even, I'm just going to turn off the ringer completely. It's not worth it. Yes. What does it take to deserve to win? What deserve to win? Have a, have something you're doing that really matters. That's all <laughs> I care about. So for us, we, we want to get rid of these unwanted calls that are driving people nuts. That's us. We want to protect people from scams. So we think we deserve to win because we're working on the right thing. Man, you're fantastic, dude. I always love having you on. You really are a great American. Like you, you, you're, you're fantastic. So unless you have anything else for us, give you a 30 seconds or a minute. You want to pitch anything? You good? No, I'm, I'm good. I, I don't have to pitch email. Everybody knows about email now. I think if I were to pitch something, it'd be we have services now for the folks making calls so they can see what's happening with their numbers. And I think that's really important beyond just is it saying spam likely? That's not helpful. What's helpful is why is it saying spam likely? Well, here's the messages you're leaving. Or here's the spoofer that's camped on your number. So that was the one thing I pitched to your audience, actually, is th there are ways now for you to see behaviorally what's happening with your phone number when it hits real consumers. It's not just numbers anymore, like a 12% call completion rate. Why? Right? What's going on? Why are you getting that? I love it, man. Well, that is extremely valuable. Can I can I uh, applaud him off this time? <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, Alex, again, thank you so much for having the show, man. You were great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. How incredible was that? I love Alex. Uh, you know, this guy really, you know, he's the creator of the robocall index. I mean, this is what everybody is looking at to determine the number of robocalls in the country. I'm a little disappointed they wouldn't give me the credit that I deserve for stopping <laughs> robocalls just yet. Uh, but soon, I mean, look, six months from now, it's going to be undeniable. I'm going to get back on the show and he's going to be like, yeah, you know what, Troutman, you did it. Yes, I did. Uh, okay, let's throw it around, see what you guys thought. I'm going to start with you, Britt. How are you doing? Good. What would you think? I thought it was really interesting. Of course, I took to his Jeep story, right, where he said <laughs> he was trying to find or find or buy a Jeep, and then he received information from, for example, like solar companies or insurance companies. And I think that's a really big problem right now, where these consents are being sold to multiple companies, and you're getting calls what you 
didn't originally, originally request, um, and so it was really interesting to hear his take about that. Do you drive a Jeep? I don't. You could get a Jeep, girl. <laughs> you could do a Jeep. I think you could do a Jeep. Really? No? Maybe I'm wrong. What, uh, what the heck do I know? But no, you're exactly right. You know, something we talked about kind of earlier on in the show, when, when people are, you know, what they expect is calls regarding a Jeep, mm -hmm. right? What they don't want are the unwanted calls regarding a different vertical. And, and But this is solvable, right? Yeah. This is solvable. And I think you know the, the FCC's uh, topically and logically related requirement that they're the, considering it's part of their FCC and PRM, I agree with that, right? Reach is an agreement with that piece, but I think the commission goes too far, or, mm -hmm. or not the commission hasn't gone too far, but I think that there's a risk that the commission does go too far. And, and certainly people out there, the NCLC, other private interest groups, public interest private special special interest groups really want this commission to do something that's really they ought not be doing but thank you for that very helpful uh tori the dame what do you think well i also agree that he hasn't given you enough credit for uh <laughs> getting rid of the robo calls yeah, this is how you advance yeah. the rest. <laughs> but also i thought his take on branded calling was very interesting now interesting now i'm not quite sure if that's a bit self-serving but i i think that you know it was interesting that he also sympathized as he's also been branded incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get numerical on the show. I want to talk about what they're doing, and I, and I do strongly believe, if it is true, which I can't substantiate on my own, but if it is true that these analytics engines are intentionally over-labeling, mislabeling, just so they can make a little bit more money, mm -hmm. right? Selling that protection, selling those uh, remediation white label branded caller ID solutions, that is a real problem, and someone's got to put a stop to that. Uh, thank you very much, Tori. Great job on the show today. And last but not least, partner, what'd you think? Hi there. Um, very interesting stuff. There was a lot of pieces to it, right? The one, though, that I took away that was really meaningful was when Alex said that we just can look at opt-in to mark or call illegal. Now, what does that mean, though? Even in our space, an opt-in, there's so much confusion around what a valid opt-in is, right? We just see the FCC coming down, the FTC coming down, saying that pre-recorded, consent for pre-recorded calls can't be transferred. So there's no longer opt-ins for transferring pre-recorded calls. So I think there's a larger issue that folks need to talk to attorneys more and kind of really understand the law before they can go make technology that's going to mark your calls as a TCPA violation. Because a lot of calls, from what I'm hearing, like, you know, you heard him say there, TCPA violation. How are you determining whether it's a TCPA violation if you're not actually looking at the website the lead was generated from, actually looking at the opt-in language, right? I think there's more complexities that come around what an opt-in is or what a valid opt-in is. Well, the, the issue is, like, where you've got clear standards. I think what Alex is trying to drive at is you can build t technology solutions to, to backstop, right, private enforcement, public enforcement, to prevent illegal calls. For instance, we know the TSR requires a disclosure, and they know that that disclosure is not in the, in the call, right. right? They can detect that. So there's going to be instances where you know, technology can tell this is illegal. Setting aside the consent issue, I think Alex might be on our side on the consent issue. You know, he's like, look, you know, we need clearer standards around consent, and, and it is kind of unfair for the government to just come in and start chopping people's arms and legs off, right, mm -hmm. when they haven't, like, you know, given them a spanking yet. They're just going to come in and just, like, start chopping off limbs. Um, but, I mean, I agree with the notion that where there are clear standards, again, not around consent, but clear standards around call to time durations or the content of calls, um, and where you can use technology solutions to determine, no, definitively, this does not contain what it's supposed to contain. There is no stop notification. It has to be there. Whatever it is, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm supportive uh, of that. Yeah, and then the second piece was, you know, when you correctly pointed out that if you're labeling yourself as someone you're not, it's defamation or it can be li libel, right? I mean, under, you know, the CFR rules on what's required for a valid opt-in or TCPA prior express written consent, you are required to list the seller that will be calling you, the end seller of the product or services. So now, you know, I just bought a car. I'm getting call calls constantly from J.P. Morgan. Now, in fact, it's not J.P. Morgan calling me. It's another entity. So say I did somehow get prior express written consent when I was purchasing my call. I don't know. Maybe I did. Maybe I should go back and read the papers. But did I consent for J.P. Morgan to call me, or did I consent for some third party alleging to be J.P. Morgan? It's very interesting, the call branding and how many companies are using that um, to the detriment of the consumer. 
So somebody's pretending to be JP Morgan that's yeah. not JP Morgan yeah. to call you? See, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like we're using good branded names. We've got, we've got a situation where where people can lie about who they are, mm -hmm. and that call comes through no problem mm -hmm. as JP Morgan when it's not JP Morgan. Correct. And you've got other cases where opposing counsel tries to call my phone, it comes up telemarketing scam, right? I mean, you all just need to get your act together, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and so kind of let me just close out saying this. I mean, again, as I said earlier in the show, all of this is very simple to me. It's all very black and white. I understand that like, not everybody is going to do what the czar says that they should do. It's too bad, because it would be a great world if they did. Uh, but when it comes to labeling, let me just end with that, right? If you companies out there, I'm talking to you, Haya, I'm talking to you, First Orion, I'm talking to the carriers, I'm talking to anybody else out there that, that's in the business of call labeling, you have to understand that, man, that is a dangerous game that you are playing. There is no safe harbor for you. And it is defamation, it is libelous, in my opinion, for you to be labeling people unwanted, scam, marketing, unless you're right. And the problem is, we're seeing over and over and over again that you're not right. And if you layer on top of that the idea that there is profitability from fake labeling, my God, I mean, I, look, the day might come when all your emails get, get demanded in discovery, and I might be the guy asking to see them, right? And I'm going to want to see all the emails between the executives. You know, if there's any question that somebody's saying, hey, look, when we started labeling more, more people came to us to give us some more money for our remediation and or our white labeling. Guys, that is going to be punitive damages. And don't go delete your emails, okay? <laughs> don't go delete them. Uh, I'm telling you, this is a dangerous game folks are playing. I'm just, I'm telling you it is. Uh, now, hopefully that's not what's happening. I don't know firsthand that that's what's happening. It seems to me, based on all the little, you know, breadcrumbs that, that I'm seeing, that that's what's happening. Uh, but if numerical's right, right, if this is something that is being done in, uh, on purpose to orchestrate a, a market demand for services that shouldn't even need, be needed because this labeling should be happening in the first place, woe unto thee. I promise you, it's not going to go well. Uh, but for all of you that are watching, I love all of you. Thank you so much for, for checking in on this, our 15th <laughs> edition of Deserve to Win. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.